and we have a special guest in a very cool place out in Wisconsin. Our, my buddy Mark Hicks from Weld's Ignition, and tonight we'll be covering ignition, sensors, actuators, and some war stories to help you guys out, and um, that's what the tech round table's about, right? Exactly. We meet um, once a month, sometimes more. So, welcome Mr. Hex. Well, let me make a comment. Thank you, thank you. I'm uh, happy to be here. If you want to see Mr. Hex really big, double click on the picture <laughs> you see of him upright. If you don't want to see him that big, just keep him as is. Uh, we're not responsible if you get nauseous. <laughs> oh, nice. <laughs> no, I only get <laughs> No, Hicks is a great guy, and uh, tonight I we, know I we do thank you. You know, one of the things we'll we'll say up front is Welds is a uh, a top-notch company. I happen to have been out to their facility, and how do you say that? Fond du Lac, or Fond du Lake, or whatever, or Fond du Lac. Fondue lock. I'll have some fondue some and cheese, orange. please. <laughs> well, we'll get Pierre to say that. At any rate, um, what a great uh, facility if you're ever out in the area. Um, stop by and see Wells. They do build a lot of OE stuff, and this is not a commercial for them, but uh, it really is a good product. So we're happy to have Mr. Hicks on. And um, anyone with a question, feel free to ask, including people out there. So, ignition. Have you had any problems? Anything you want to ask Mark about? Like, you know, Ford coils. Why do they break down so much? Oh, uh, okay. that's a great question. Yep. And I'm glad you brought that up. Especially the... Um, <laughs> and how do newer ones these days? Okay, the, the ones that fit on the 5.4s and the 4.6s, no. does that work out? That's five fours. in the EVAMs. And those things are okay. like nightmares. Especially one in the last wow. cylinder all the way in the back. <laughs> all right, all right. That, that is uh, that's a great question. You can see this right here. Why? Why? And this is, this is a case that we send around with our salesman. And what we do is we uh, have a number of different examples in here of how we've improved on the original equipment product. And uh, that was a great challenge for us is the... Uh, the Ford coil. And what we found is that it's really not a coil problem. Okay, it's it's how the engine is configured that it, it holds the moisture inside the cylinder. And if you have a, a seal in the back of the hood that's leaking or a condenser tube on the uh, air conditioning that's dripping down to a cylinder, it's going to amplify the problem. But what we did to help alleviate that is uh, we put uh, we, when we build our coils, we build them with a, we add a green, green grade grease with them. And we also add a, a tube with it, with every coil. And what that does, it, it, it doesn't cure the problem, but it, uh, it stops the water from wicking up the coil uh, for a longer period of time, so they last longer. Okay, so Mark, Mark, let me ask you a question. So what you're saying is you have some grease to go around the boot of the coil? Right, it goes, goes on the boot in the spring. And what happens is as the engine warms up, the moisture in the, uh, in the, in the, in the channel there starts to wick up the spring. It starts to evaporate and wick up the spring. And it gets up into the uh, secondary of the coil and sorts it off. That's why they fail. And is that why they're so green when you take them apart? That's why they're so green or rustic. You see that rusty color at the end of the uh, spark plug loop? That's why. So it, so you it's got to get that moisture out of there. So it's the water vapor? Uh, yes. Okay. So it's the water From the cylinder wicking all the way up the spark plug thread? No, no, no. Right. Not from inside it's the up, cylinder. It wicks up the spring. Actually, I have one here, too. Uh, wicks up the spring and it works out, out the secondary in the coil. Okay. So, so it's a design it, problem, basically. So, well, says it it's, it's a design of the engine problem, yeah. not right. so much the coil. Right. And we tried, here's the, here's the boot that goes on there, like that. And we even tried a bunch of different things, like putting a, a duckbill sill over it, uh, that kind of thing, but then it would build up pressure inside the, uh, right. the cylinder or the uh, channel there, and I'd blow the, 
the plug right off the or the the, uh, the uh, coil right off the plug. Yeah. Hey, Mark. We tried a bunch of different things before we came up with that grease. Hey, Mark. But it really did. It cut back uh, dramatically on our returns. It really did help. Mark, let me interrupt you one second. Your your camera is auto focusing, and you're getting oh, blurry. Okay. Oh, I see. Just so you know, because right. so when you held that boot up, I just hold back here. Can you see that now? It's uh, kind of fun. It sounds fuzzy. like it sounds like it looks like you're holding blurry. do. Okay, sorry. Macro. We could we could see your eyeglasses fine. Oh good. <laughs> <laughs> but but that, it really was an engine design problem, and as far as I know, they really haven't uh, changed that much. What kind of heat? What kind of heat? Uh, is heat a big issue for these coils as well? Well, a little bit. Um, the way they built the. Uh, uh, the coil itself, there is a slight problem inside that we did correct where the laminations come together. And when they did get hot on the OE coil, they were expanding and spreading apart. And that's why if you see the top of the coil kind of melt off, that was that's what was happening there. How about those rainbow colors that you see on the sides of the coil that sometimes that's, look a little purple? Yeah. That's overheating, right? Yep, that's overheating from the laminations are trying to spread apart. Especially in the EVM. So yes. now does welds beef the coil up at all or? No, no. same output. Same output, okay. Same output. Very good. I have a question on, it, on the ignition coils. If you have a high mileage car and you develop a misfire and it turns out to be a bad coil, is your recommendation to replace all the coils or just the one that's Great question. That's oh, Mr. Miss Martin. On a high mileage uh, car. It all depends on how much they cost and how much money the customer has. Replace, replace them all. Uh, it, it, it's hard to say. Usually, the reason why the coil fails is because something went wrong in the secondary tension. Usually. Uh, spark plug went out or that spark plug is getting wet, maybe. Uh, Valve cover. Something. Something's happening there where it's causing that coil to fall more than what it should. Or not get really get wet, it's getting too lean if an injector is uh, not spraying enough fuel, something, something like that. Or uh, what we see a lot, with, uh, a lot of calls we get on the tech line are that, uh, geez, I replaced this coil and it still doesn't work. Well, they didn't check to see if the computer was actually uh, hmm. controlling it. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times what happens when the, uh, when the secondary windings go out, the primaries go out too. And when the primaries go out, usually it takes the, call, or the uh, PCM with it. Driver, yeah. We've got some questions on the internet Greg has here. Can I selfishly okay. ask my question first? Uh, one of the people waiting then you can ask. Oh. Yeah. Um, there's a comment, um, coils mounted to the valve cover on the 3.0 liter Taurus crack all the time from heat. Is, would you agree with that? Yes. All right. Yep, um, we get a lot of calls on that too. We have another question. How does the green grease differ from the dielectric grease? Good question. Uh, great question. Dielectric grease is for electrical. It's trying to uh, contain an electrical current. Uh, the green grease is a marine grade grease, so it resists moisture. Okay, and remember, it's mm -hmm. the moisture that wicks up that spring. That shorts out the secondary of that coil. Does that come with your coils? Yes. We, we use it in manufacturing. We put it on the top of the spring where it meets the, uh, the secondaries. But then we have a tube along with it with instructions to tell you to put it on the spring and also on the connections on the top, do you, the primary connection. Do you sell that separately as a different part number? Uh, we do. Uh, do you know the part number off the top of your head? No. I tell you, man, what good are you? You'll, you'll get back to us on that, I hope. Yeah. Thanks. I'm oh. sure any parts store that has a catalog will be able to find it. Oh, yeah. If they knew how to read it. Okay, Craig, go ahead. You um, have a I know there's a, a TSB for 5.4 liters for uh, the fuel injectors. Like, um, because using the long check, sonically, we actually, uh, on one of these Fords, the misfire is caused by fuel injectors, and we, uh, 
we bench tested him and ultrasonically cleaned him and stuff. So he said on his secondary end is usually how a coil will go bad. Like, could a fuel injector be sprained, like, inadequately, and that is really what's making a lot of these coils fail? Yeah, when you miss fire, will cause it yeah. more stress, of course. Or 130,000 mile spark plugs. Yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. yeah but you on know those cars, it's... you don't even want to take them out. You know it's what like it is? Brakes. On a lot of vehicles, if you're not getting enough hydrocarbons in the cylinder, the hydrocarbon yeah, chain, fire. when it starts firing, firing the KV goes coil, up, up. The, the KV goes up and up, like Pierre said, yeah. and you're just overheating right. that coil big yeah. time. Good. And, and that's why, and by the way, I'll just chime in. And my recommendation to my customers was always, if I had one coil bad and I saw rainbow colors or, you know, mile well, wide gaps. 69, your rainbow colors. Mile, mile wide gaps on the spark plugs and all of that. My standard recommendation was to replace all the coils. My, you know, I, I don't want them coming back with another cylinder. Yeah. Uh, they've been tormented enough. Put new ones in, put the new plugs in, fix it. It comes down to educate your customer and let them make a choice. Especially right. on a Ford. You do a Ford van or something? No, you Come on. You, you got to do all of them. Yeah. And besides that, if you recommend that and they then don't approve it and then they come back with a problem, grave it. I know the price of the Ford coils have gone down. It depends if you have to, like, on the escapes, you have to remove the intake manifold to, to get. So then you you have to do all those. Yeah, right. yeah it's crazy I mean, not to do It's that. crazy, yeah. right. You know, but, like, in the F-150, they're, like, right there for the taking. A lot of people are work trucks, and they're being cheapos, and, you know, I recommend yeah. only, no. but at least then it, it's feasible people to do cheap? Yeah, right. no way. Customers and, <laughs> and, well, the bottom line is what I'm saying is it's not just the technical part of it. If you've recommended them, they've refused it, they've declined it, and they have a problem down the road, you're well, clean. It gets you down you're a good. it gets you down a bad road because what happens is that you fix one misfire coil, it's the second misfire coil. So the third time they don't want a diagnostic. Put a coil in, and if you do and it doesn't work, then it's your butt, and mm -hmm. it's not your fault. They got used to an inadequate diagnosis, and because they're you know, it's like a conditioned dog, you know, they're seeing coil, <laughs> misfire coil, you know, and there's other things that cause misfires. Do we have yeah. any other questions up there, Craig, or? Um, not, not right now. Okay. You know, I, Wells really doesn't take a stand on, you know, uh, should you replace all the coils at once, but personally, I agree with you 100%. Very good. It's good. It sells I, I, more I, coils. I got another question for you. Uh, when you remove a spark plug, you see that orange is lines that come up with want the plug. Is that an indication that it's bypassing the plug and overheating the coil as well? I think he's yeah, talking yeah. about combustion gases going yes. by between the metal and the insulator. You also use right. the corona stain. It's jumping past the, it's not going down the electrode? Well no, it's going past no. the porcelain up, porcelain. up the up the uh, up the boot. We have the boot right up the top. And actually yeah. overheating yeah. your coil. It's, it's, it's ah. not blowing. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, like and, uh, I don't know if you guys saw our video on uh, anti but that can cause that also. Ah, since you brought that up, Mr. Hicks, anti oh, God. I know you have a genius in your office who writes for Motor Magazine. Yes, we do. And uh, I did read his article, but uh, I must say I disagree somewhat. Okay. And I'm going to tell you what. If you, put too, if you put too much anti seize obviously it's a problem. If you don't yeah. put any anti-seize, you're going to have another problem and pull the threads out. Regardless, of what, regardless yeah. of what kind of coating they say they put on those threads. Exactly. Now, a small yeah. amount, you know, if you use the copper, the good stuff, and you put a small amount on the right way and it does not have a chance to leak down onto the electrode, that will work just well. If, you, just well. if you would have watched our video, you just saw right at the end, that's exactly what I said, is use it sparingly. Come on, I was stealing your thunder. <laughs> yeah, that's good. But you know what, uh, Mr. Dale, uh, after he had published that article, he called me, and he said, uh, when you ended your Mr. video, Dale. it was much better, Thank I should have put that in my article. Oh, good. Because see, I, that's what yeah. I had disagreed with. You know, I've yeah. been doing it for years and never had a problem, but I have seen people... They take the brush out and they slop it on. Yeah, it's a dab. Yeah. It's, you got major nightmares. There used to be a Brill Cream commercial. A little dab will do you. <laughs> and uh, I'm, I'm totally honest with you, the first vehicle like this I ran into was about uh, seven years ago. And you know who put the plugs in that one? Yours truly. Ah, see? Look at so, that. Yeah. 
and uh, and I was I couldn't wait till I hung another one, and uh, that this one was it. And uh, what a, you know, it's all about the less. You know, just uh, just be careful when you put it on. Don't don't put too much on. Excellent. On that note, what plug would you suggest on a regular basis to use? The OE plug. Oh God, our sister company is all Okay, yeah, oh. that's my answer. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm under the opinion that the OE spark plug should always be used all the time, that's no matter what. Question. Yeah, I, I agree. With I answer. agree. I yeah. agree with I'm that. From Craig Company. I, I can't answer that. <laughs> we, we understand. We understand. But from experience, you know, uh, working on a lot of state programs, when that check engine light comes on, or as I like to say, the use sup light, you know, the customer gets kind of ticked off when. That light comes on because you have the wrong plug in there, and there's, right. there's enough examples of that. I'm not saying Autolite's a very good plug. I would use that in a Ford uh, product, you know, Ford Lincoln Mercury. Um, but I'm not going to throw that in a GM or mm -hmm. BMW or Mercedes. I, I think that the modern engines are so so tightly engineered and so sensitive that little differences can come up and bite you and. Even in like you know, I'm a BMW guy. They used to use Bosch exclusively, and they ended up using NGK Platinums. Bosch makes a Platinum, which is an approved part number. But guess what? There's been problems with it. Well, you have to use the NGK in that application. What about Nissan? What their their ignition system? You don't put the right plug in that thing. It's your light is coming on. Yeah. So the bottom line is use the OE plug in your. Probably have no problem. I actually have the car here with another problem, but like a year and a half ago, it came with an oxygen sensor code for heater circuit. Now, nothing wrong with this heater circuit. I'm not going to say the brand, but it had another good aftermarket oxygen sensor. And the heater circuit turned on and everything, but there's something in the engineering that PCM that's looking for something slightly it's, different. It's looking for a current draw, and, and when it doesn't see the same current draw, it flags it. A lot of those. Right? Oh, yeah. That's and Mark, does, does welds make oxygen sensors no we don't that's the reason right there's too many you know, it's yeah. a big... I'll tell you, what, you know it, it, it's a good thing that you guys uh, kind of brought that up and it, it's very important to try these parts on vehicles before you sell, sell them and uh, we got two guys uh that that's all they do all day long they hang, hang parts on cars and test them hmm. that's good that's all they do um, I, I have a question uh, for you, Mark. Um, yeah. we're, we're asked by the audience. Okay, someone asked another question, so now popped out of the way. Okay, one second. If okay. the primary coils damage and it takes out the PCM along with it, what is the best way to diagnose the PCM for failure? Uh, the best way is to see if it's actually triggering the coil. Yeah, check the driver and, and the PCM. You, know, the, you can do that with a test light if you want, but uh, you know there. Tesla takes how many amps? It's in milliamps, isn't it? Right. Coil is going to be pulling like six plus. I kind of hesitate on that because they're, you know, without, you got to use an amp to really find out if it's working. But, uh, you know, a lot of guys, you know, they're really good at that. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. 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 Thank that right, is correct, yeah. and, you, and that's why a lot of manufacturers have that, uh, because normally that won't take out the, uh, the PCM. That's right. It's a direct it's, driver. It's a driver that goes out the PCM. Yeah, at that yeah, point, the PCM, uh, on the one that has the circuitry right. in the coil, right. the, the, the PCM is just right. sending a signal. I right, had a shop that's correct. Right. I had a shop that uh, took out a PCM using the test light on an O2 Volkswagen. Sure. Oh, is that right? Oh, uh, resistance. Yeah. I am. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Not resistance. Yeah, he was. That's a good point. Yeah, yeah. that's that's so. why you know you need you need something in the same current range or amperage range, like a headlight. You know, it's just like that old GM test when they used to have the two eights with the coils that would go bad, mm -hmm. and they would tell you, oh, take a take the coil off and the two little pins that come out on the the GM module there. You take your test light and if it lights up, the driver's good. No, it's not. Because that's milliamps for a test light. If you put a headlight with a couple of clamps on there and you're able to make a headlight go on and off, now you're in a six amp plus range. All right. And now you, your driver's good. Now, the thing that Ed's talking about, though, is somebody 
put too much current through the trigger circuit from the computer. Well, no, yeah. doubt. Right. no doubt. So read the wiring diagram. Right. Mm -hmm. Know what you're looking at before you start power probing or test lighting anything. Exactly. You know, that's one thing. We have a power probe right here. Power probe is a great, great tool. One of, very cool. one of our uh, sponsors as well, but Rich is just picking us up to, to sell to one of his, uh, his customers. It's a, it's a great tool, but you really need to know how to use it. Absolutely. You don't put power and ground to the wrong oh, side. Exactly. Shame you on you out. and let the smoke out. Yeah. Yeah. Shame yeah. on you if you do. Should be a video, do's and don'ts of a power <laughs> Yeah. That would show people enough. Uh, what's the next question? Okay. Um, Someone said OE oxygen sensors are the best, OE plugs are the best. Okay. Um, it's the safest way. Have you ever but seen let's a ask, before? Let's, <laughs> let's ask Mark, Mark, um, yeah. does welds make anything for OEs? Can and we make, you, um, can we you make name? 5,000 part numbers for a GM. And we make a bunch of numbers for Ford, Chrysler, and some foreign manufacturers. Thank you. And I was like, I was super impressed being out there. I'm not just saying that as a commercial. If you go there, it looks like a spaceship place. You know, they got computers doing everything. And guys walking around in white coats and stuff. And yeah, well, that's Mark. They have him in a straight jacket. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't want to lift that up. But since you brought it up, what the hell? Don't touch nothing. <laughs> I'm sorry, Hicks. Uh, that's all right. Uh, can I talk about a uh, GIS call? Sure. Yes. On OE design? Okay. Uh, GIS call for uh, GM. Going around forever. You ever see these guys fail? You see them uh, with a with or when they're blown out through the bottom? Oh yeah. Then, oh yeah. This guy, this guy here. I don't know if you can see it. This one doesn't have a cover on, so it's kind of weird looking. But uh, uh, these, this is DIS. So what it does is it fires out of the secondary winding. So one in the secondary winding can be considered a positive signal. The other one would be the negative signal. So it's the source of the current. So it goes out, fires, pulls the spark plugs, and comes back to the coil. Right. All right. What happened with that is I got the primary and secondary winding here. Give me one second. There were high failure rates on those things. There were, yes, very high failure rate. And what would happen is, uh, like if you get high secondary resistance, spark plug wire starts to go out, or the 100,000 mile spark plugs, that kind of thing, start to go out, what it's going to do is it's going to take the coil off, it's going to uh, if the spark plug wire tries to go, it goes out, that spark is going to try to find a way through the engine block to fire the other spark plug and then make the path back to the secondary winding. That's how you can get a single cylinder misfire on a DIS system. And, uh, you know, it blows through the bottom, goes through the module, so you're sending, you know, 40 kV through the module also as a conductor. And uh, that's not good either. So what would happen with that is you have the secondary winding right here, and the primary winding is on the inside of it, like that, okay? And what would happen when the secondary winding was overcharged, it would send the current through the primary winding through the module, yeah, back and it used the module as a conductor. What we did to change that is we put a dielectric sleeve like this, we put the primary winding in that, and then we put the sleeve into the secondary winding. Okay, so that dielectric sleeve prevents that current from jumping to the primary winding. We did a test with our OEs and a competitor's coil. We put 12 of each on a test bed, and we ran them wide open. Uh, within uh, 48 hours of running, all the competitors and all the OEs were dead. You're talking when you say up. wide open, high KV demand. Max, right. Maximum KV. We had our first failure at about 400 hours. And when we shut the, shut the test off at 800 hours, six of ours are still running. Pretty good. Very good. Yep. And, really good help. And this, these coils is, are on the waste spark system. Yeah, correct. That is correct. It's a GM DIS system. Well, you got the individual coil. 
Who who carries Wells, for example? Like I know Advance carries BWD. Like uh, you can also buy Wells through Advance. Okay. Uh, it's a special order now, but uh, you can buy it through Advance. Uh, AutoZone and CarQuest are our biggest customers, okay. but there are a lot of uh, WDs too. That That's what is it? So does CarQuest is their regular coil a Wells coil, or are they just one amongst like a red box, blue box thing? Uh, we got we're in the blue box. Okay, so if you get a blue box coil from CarQuest, it's a it's a Wells. Yeah. Okay. It's good to know. There's a lot of CarQuest out there, so blue box it's a Wells product. Just want to make sure. It's, it's I'm not sure. I think we're in some of the red boxes too, but I, I don't know. Is there a way to decipher what coils in the box? Yeah, is there a way to tell it's a welds? Uh, on some of the products, yes. Uh, we do have a manufacturer mark that kind of looks like uh, a picnic table or two staples back to back. If you ever see that, that's oh, one of our well products. Symbol. Uh, whether it's in an OE box or wherever it came from. Uh, makes, that makes a big difference. Is that on the product or on the box? On the product. It's on the product, and, and many times we have to put it on the inside because uh, our customers don't want to uh, have it on the outside. Very good. So AutoZone and CarQuest and, Car Quest and, and Car Advanced Quest. Special yeah. Order. And what I'll do, G, is I'll find out uh, what WDs are near you. Okay. And I'll, I'll let you know. Very good. Yeah. Very good. Okay, other questions. There's a comment. Oh, comment. Someone says, oh, good. the OEs really don't make any of their own parts anymore. Nippon Denso is part owned by Toyota, and Delphi still has some GM ownership, but I think that's about it. I don't know anything about that. So. Well, actually, uh, Mike Dale wrote a nice article on that uh, in uh, motor. What is it, motor? Or yeah. motor, agent. motor, motor, motor. Motor, okay. And uh, just in this uh, this month's uh, magazine, I just read it. You wrote it. You you wrote a nice article on that. And he didn't mention Wells. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Look at that. Well, maybe he doesn't like working it. <laughs> you, you, uh, I'm only kidding. <laughs> you also make a lot of sensors, obviously. That, uh, you know, I know we're talking about coils here, but uh, like crank yeah. sensors for like the seven three diesels and. The, oh yeah. Okay. And yeah, we had a huge, you know what, we, when we first started manufacturing those, we had a huge problem with those. And uh, what we did is we rounded up every 73 Ford in the county and uh, started putting sensors on them until we figured out what was going on. And actually, uh, OE was making problems, had problems with that too. And it was because the uh, computer actually wanted to sync up at 180 degrees and 180 degrees uh, on the uh, on the trigger wheel, and originally when we made it, our sensor was only syncing up on the on the top dead center, not on the bottom dead center. And uh, OEs were having problems with that too. We corrected that, and uh, we don't have any issues with that anymore. I haven't gotten a call for a long time, years. Do you guys like mess up a lot of the cars in Wisconsin to make sure the rest of the country has good parts? Is that you know, we do. We do. We do. <laughs> if we can't find, if, if we can't find a car, I'll, uh, I'll find one somewhere, rent it or something. <laughs> and it does get nice and cold as well as nice and warm out there. I heard Enterprise yeah. is doing well. <laughs> <laughs> Mark, um, um, yes. distributor caps for General Motors, the flat caps. Oh, boy. Yes. Are they bulletproof now from Wells? Uh, they're pretty darn good. Uh, you know, I can't tell you that Wells is perfect on everything, uh, but they're pretty darn good. And I'm glad you asked that question because I just happen to have one right here. Uh -oh. <laughs> oh, look at that. He's got everything right there. <laughs> so you can see. Oh, yeah. Uh, you know, you can see how it's made. Mm -hmm. And um, if you put this on a vehicle, it wouldn't last very long. But. Uh, it's just so you can see how the how the uh, conductors are done, <laughs> and where Oli was making a mistake on that is each one of these conductors in here were two pieces, and so when you put it into the mold, and you got to remember that this it goes into a mold, and the plastic is injected in there, and I mean it's injected hot and fast with a lot of pressure, 
And so when you got two pieces of metal together that are just leaved together, you'll get one that pushes away from the other. And you can see here how close these conductors are. So if you get one of these to move any, any bit at all, you're going to drop that dielectric strength on that cap. Mm -hmm. What we did is we designed a machine to make these in one piece. The whole conductor is knurled off on the end. The whole thing is made out of one piece. So now when you put it into the mold, you got a hell on the top and the bottom, it can't move. And uh, we, we found that uh, they last a lot longer that way. Now, the other thing about these, and I'm sure you guys know this, is to clear out the, uh, the uh, filters in the bottom of the distributor, mm -hmm. make sure that they're open. Uh, that's very important to get that air flow through there. If you look at the bottom of that rotor, you will see it's all lined with fins. That's why those fins are on there. It's just move that air through that distributor. It's critical. Okay, and that distributor is not a great design in the first place. But uh, make sure that those uh, those ports are open. Now, what about the color black? Why not white? Like uh, when they corrected the problem with the quad four motors, pretty much. <laughs> Ooh. Well, apparently, uh, four, four. I don't know. I don't know. That was a good idea, just to let you know that you got the right, the updated. Uh, yeah. Uh, well, I'm talking about the carbon in black has a lot of higher content than the white, so you, you could transfer you know, electricity a lot better, I should say. The, oh, okay. I, I think it's the same plastic. It, yeah, they just changed the colors to let you know you had an updated just, one. Yeah. Okay. So I thought it was that's that's black had a lot of more carbon in it. Would no. Transfer. No. They can't put carbon in it. It no. would be a conductive yeah, insulator. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. It, another that was, that was a headache for a while, <laughs> too, for all we. Uh, yeah, they, they were shorting out between the, the uh, towers there, uh, where the coils connected. Okay. I have a question, Mark. Sure. Getting back to the GM caps, you see okay. a lot of these uh, rotors, and sometimes they have holes burned through the center where they start arcing. What causes that? High secondary resistance. Yep, that's what does it. Uh, we got wires that are going out, spark plugs are going out, yep. something. Mm -hmm. yeah. Something's causing that coil to put out more than it should. Yeah, it's cool. It's just like the uh, AGI GM that used to have that problem, the same thing. And sometimes... Uh, start burning through those rollers, uh, something, something's forcing that coil to put out more. Yeah, sometimes in the HEIs, it used to, we used to call a punch through, it would go through the rotor, and sometimes even hit the module. Ooh. Yeah. And when you seen <laughs> it looked like rust, it was a red rubber washer that went under the coil, between the yeah. carbon spring, oh, yes. that would yeah. blow through. It wasn't rust. It was actually the voltage was taking that and blowing that all over the place. Hmm. With the rubber washer? With the rubber washer. Then they went to a black washer, and you would see black all over. Right. The trick was to put dielectric grease yeah. on both sides of it. Right. I remember and that. Make sure the pin was down and a ground bar. Oh, that ground yeah. bar. A lot of people forgot the, the ground, ground bar. bar. That ground was yeah. very important. I'm glad you mentioned that. I was just going to go there. We, get, uh, we still have a lot of do it yourselfers and uh, technicians uh, older that work on older cars like that, and we get them back sometimes. And, those and, and the yeah, right. primary wires are actually burned through that coil. Oh yeah, mm -hmm. oh, right. they didn't put the ground strap on. That's right. And, and, that, the yeah. and the other problem on those HEIs were they made the pickup coil and the ignition coils counterclockwise and clockwise windings. <laughs> you had to make sure you had the right setup. That's right. That's Otherwise, it's, it's kind of like uh, the old cars when you put your sun machine on there. Oh, yeah, and, upside uh, down. Yeah, the coil hooked up backwards, the, the, the spoke was upside down. Kind yeah. Of thing. yeah. Same thing. Andrew. Pretty neat. Now, let's, let's talk about some sensors that you guys make. Can you tell us what sensors you make? Uh, we make a lot of sensors. <laughs> well, give us some of the common um, ones that you make. Uh, throttle position sensors, map sensors, uh, DPFE sensors. In fact, I got one here. I have a DPFE sensor. A little like this. proof. This guy here for the board. Right, Are they any better? Any better than the OE? Yes. Uh, the OE had like a, a diaphragm in there. Right. <laughs> that uh, kind of looked like the back of a toilet seat. And what would happen is the exhaust gases would get in there and erode it away. Exhaust gases are inert gas, very corrosive gas. 
So you'd uh, start eating away the steel, get into the circuitry, and poof, it was done. And sometimes it bring down that five volt reference. Yes. Mm -hmm. What we did is, if you can see this, it's got actually two pressure sensors on it, one on each side instead of one. Oh, and yeah. Got very tiny holes in it. And uh, what it does is it measures the pressure on each side of the orifice, and that way it calculates whether or not you got EDR fault. And no exhaust gas can get inside. It'll last a lot longer that way. Because and they're a lot more accurate in fact. It's just measuring pressure. Yeah. Hmm. Now, right. do, you, do you also make uh, mass airflow sensors? We do not. Okay. Uh, the reason why we don't is because most people out there are buying rebuilt, and we don't do any rebuilt. I don't blame you. From us as well. Oh yeah, this yeah like Cardone, does Cardone. Of, Cardone does a lot of those. I would too. buy a rebuilt. Yeah. I would buy by the calibration. Got to be scared of a new one. Just Any a nightmare for me. It's, for me, it's new or forget about yeah. it. Yeah. So someone asked, "What's new at Wells for today's cars, product-wise?" Good question. I didn't hear it. Craig, <laughs> wasn't that a good question? Oh, I see it. What's new at Wells uh, for today's cars? Yeah. Uh, what are we doing new? We're doing uh, uh, yaw rate uh, sensors. Uh, we do a lot of the new voltage regulators. Um, we haven't gotten, in, gotten into the collision sensors and that stuff too much. Um, we're exploring some other sensors that uh, vehicles are using as far as uh, distance sensors and things like that. We haven't gotten into uh, manufacturing yet, but uh, we will sell them, but usually what we will sell is the OE, we'll buy it from the OE. When we start manufacturing, we manufacture about 60% of what we sell. That doesn't mean we manufacture 60% of 38,000 part numbers, but it means we manufacture the more popular stuff. You know, if you're selling two or three of them a year, it doesn't pay the two off or something like that. Right. Now, you know, the, the, the tooling for just this, for this is mass, uh, this uh, EPFP sensor is somewhere around two hundred thousand dollars. So it's it's expensive, and you right. got you got to have a, a payback within a certain period of time. Got to make a lot of sensors. Now, didn't you guys beef up like your crank sensors, the the AC generator ones that the oil would go through and then go up to those lovely GM modules? No, we didn't. No. <laughs> How about on the Nissan? We didn't do with those, but uh, they sure do crack. And, they do uh, crack, you bet. Yeah. There's a major problem with one of those. The cam crank sensor? Yeah, do you make cam crank sensors for Nissans? We do. Yes, we do. Oh, so do, that's a big problem. Do they get saturated with the wheel, too? The, you're talking about the 2.5, I think it is? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. 2.5, that's, that's a big problem. Yeah, the camera and crane sensor are the same part number on that, yeah. but yes, we do make those. It comes as a kit, like the Nissan ones do? No, you got to buy you gotta buy both separately. Okay. And are they any better than the OEs that fail at a high rate? Well, the no. OE's been updated. We didn't, we didn't change anything on those. Okay. Do they make connectors for pigtails? Oh, or the yeah. sensors. We have tons of pigtails. Oh, cool. Uh, that's cool. Where can you get them out this way? Uh, the two places I talked about. Oh, yeah. And I'll, I'll let you know what WDs are near. That's good. Are here. I, I actually don't know. Well, of course, you're saying so CarQuest may handle that. Oh, yeah. Yeah, they do it. Are they color well, color coded per vehicle? You have to. Either. You're going to have to no. tell your car counterman to look for it because they may not know they have it. They may not know they got they're, it. Because they're they're not color are coded either. They still come one solid color. Yeah, they're white. You know, they can fit a number of different vehicles, vehicles and uh, you know you can't put uh, you can't have 15 part numbers. Nice. Oh yeah. That's interesting. Correct. Yeah. Question. Here's a uh, here's a cam sensor you guys might be familiar with. Uh, when it goes on the board, can't really on the synchronizer, uh, fuzzy. Yeah, you're, oh yeah, you're fuzzy. I can see your head. Oh, the one for Taurus. Yeah, the the cover is off of this one, so you can see on the inside. Mm -hmm. Oh right yes, there. yes, yes. I see it. All right. Okay. Yeah. Uh, what we did with this, and if you notice, when these usually fail, that magnet falls out. Right. It's a I synchronizer. Right, the synchronizer. So now you got a four hundred dollar job where it should have been a. 
you know, seventy five or a hundred dollars out, right? That is correct. Mm. What we did with that is sell glue. You can, if you can <laughs> see this right here, right there, we first of all we put a five hundred pound pole strength on that magnet, and then we encapsulated it in plastic. Okay, so now there's no way that that magnet can fall out of there and wreck the synchronizer. So you, made it, so you made it bang as strong as What's that? You made the magnet stronger. We made well we made the adhesive that the magnet sticks to stronger. Yes, the magnet is the same strength okay. as the OE, but where it sticks to is stronger because remember uh, G was talking about the uh, the crank sensors on the GM that crack all the time? Yeah. The reason why that happens is because it's an attraction, it's a magnetic attraction to a trigger wheel. Right. So you got that magnetic pull on that magnet as that wheel spins around. And then when the space comes in, okay, the trigger part, it's a release. It's a release. Right, exactly right. It's a trick, it's a pull on it and a release. And it rattles and anything, it. Wow. Anything with these, that's why they fail. That's why they break out of there. And uh, so we corrected that. And we've never ever had a failure. None. Zero. Right. We got a couple of comments here. What's uh, with Antex fuel pumps. Oh, don't bring that up. I, I guess I shouldn't go there either, so we'll we'll have to skip. That's okay. That Airtex fuel pump is uh, our sister company, so I, I honestly can't answer that. Okay. Anyone here have comments on it? I wouldn't buy one. That's my comment. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and then uh, we got we got a lot we're, better. We're, we're got, gonna we're gonna bring those guys on next month. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Put them in a hot seat. Then we got uh, Mr. Ramsey here. New GMs are called multi-functioning airflow sensors. Barrow, mass airflow, IAT, all-in-one, buy new, not rebuilt. How much do I agree with that? 100%. And someone here, so much made in China. Is welds made in the U.S.? Yeah. Welds is made in the U.S. Uh, we also have a, our, our company, part of our company, our plant in Reynosa, Mexico. It's, uh, it's, it's uh, our engineers are in charge of it. Everything that's done down there is in our control. It's like right across uh, the border. Cheaper and cheaper. Do we have parts that come from China? Yes, we do. Uh, we buy parts from China too, but everything that's made, uh, all these sensors, these DPFE sensors, they're, the electronics is made in Fond du Lac, Wisconsin. These are made in Fond du Lac. Our coils are made in Reynosa, Mexico. That's where our plant is. Uh, Switches, uh, things like that, uh, we do buy from China. Well, I know. What's your warranty? Our warranty, as far as our company goes, whatever our customer does, it's up to them. But our warranty on all of our parts is, if that part ever fails, we will tell you, we will send you a new part. Thank you. Well, that's very damn good. Yeah. Um, do you have a tech line? Someone asks. I'm glad you asked that. Yes, we do. What's your number? In fact, I'm in, charge, I'm in charge of the tech line. Uh, my title is the technical services manager, and uh, we answer about 150 calls a day. Uh, our hours are 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. Central Standard Time, Monday through Friday. And our 800 number is 1-800-558-9770. And if you go on our website, can you repeat that? Can over. you repeat that number again? Go slowly. Yep. One eight hundred five five eight nine seven seven zero. Oh, I forgot. Can you say that one more time? <laughs> 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 no, I, now, now it is a commercial. Now you have to go to our website. <laughs> now, you know, Mark. While we're talking about your hotline, how about that great Fine. little newsletter you put out? Why don't you speak about that? Yeah. Well, you know, sometimes we get some uh, some writers in there that aren't very good. You know, usually from the, they're from the East Coast, but we still prevail. Um, <laughs> now, like, what <laughs> could, that was a good shot. <laughs> now, what can we call the tech line with? Like, just any problem? Any anything that has to do with vehicle electronics. Uh, if your brake pads are wearing out too quick, we're not going to answer that question. And what uh, if, second. and like, does it cost anything? Nope, it's absolutely free. 
So should I fire my ATAC and just call you? <laughs> <laughs> well, if you were a smart man. <laughs> so um, your counterpoint is your newsletter. When yeah. does that come out? That, well, we try to put it out uh, four times a year. This year we haven't been too good. Um, it takes a lot to put one of those together, but uh, we're getting closer to getting this one done. Uh, but it's, it's, it's really written for technicians. And uh, we have examples in there of uh, calls that we get on the tech line, uh, actual vehicles uh, that have failed. It's just like our, vi uh, our videos. This is real world stuff. This is stuff that actually fails and we diagnose. We don't make anything up. Yeah. Uh, I don't. I don't put up with that. I don't like it, and I. I don't. Don't do things that way. This, this is the real deal. Now, Mark, let's yeah. let's talk about your videos, which I think are pretty damn good. I'd say giving you we a have plug. a lot of fun. We have a lot of fun with our videos, and uh, you know, really, that's that's my main job these days is uh, editing videos and shooting videos. Uh, about ten years ago, I started learning how to do it, and it's turned into a a job. Um, and we've done real well with those, and I think the difference between ours and, and others out there is um, we don't hire a company to come in and do them. We do them all ourselves, right in house. And uh, all the actors, everybody you see in there, are guys that work at well. <laughs> and uh, we, we have all the fun. The uh, we've been doing well. We've got we're up to two and a half million people now. Get about 125,000 views a month, and uh, we're doing real well. Now they're they're the best in the business. Like our, I mean, look at this round table. We have cups out, wires all over the place. I mean, you couldn't get any more shoddy. You guys have real professional videos. It's the best in the business. It's automotive education. You do you do a very nice job. We Thank do you, we we just do the real thing here. You know we. We do this in our spare time. Unlike you, we don't get paid for it. <laughs> well, I, yeah, I don't get paid either. I know, you're doing this. And we appreciate you my doing boss, this. My boss is going to be watching this, so yes, I don't get paid. I don't get paid. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Mr. Steve Hillebrand, um, Mark is doing this on his own time. <laughs> That's the guy. <laughs> uh, but, you know, about one out of every 10 or 15 cars that we look at end up being a video. We like to have good lessons in there too, not just here, this is how we diagnose it. We like to have a good lesson in there, or yeah. three or four. You know, Mark, when I uh, had asked you for a couple of EGR videos that I used in the state of Massachusetts, uh, and you yeah. were kind enough to send them along because I thought they were good. I, I made a few myself, but you had some real good examples, and I got to tell you, the texts that were in the class really thought they were good and had not heard about you know, welds on YouTube. They didn't really know you guys had videos. So, um, you know, if anyone out there that's watching us tonight or sees us on YouTube, um, if you haven't seen a welds uh, video, there's a whole bunch of them, and with his two plus million hits there, go take a look at them. Uh, they're, they're really good, they're helpful. Short, about 10 minutes or so, but they get to the point. Good job. We actually, yeah, we actually have three channels uh, the one you want to go to is the Weld Tech channel. It's all one word, Weld Tech. And that's got them all on there. Very good. Now, does yeah, anyone we're have... Connected, we're connected to PSD on that channel also. If not, we'd come out and break your leg, so you <laughs> haven't... <laughs> That's a uh, chance from the Bronx talk. I know where you live. <laughs> Remember, I've been there. <laughs> I love you guys. I don't know why. <laughs> nice. No, but it's uh, it's really a, a pleasure <laughs> dealing with you. <laughs> no joke aside. At any rate, uh, didn't we have a couple of war stories we were talking about before? Oh, my Subaru? Yeah, yeah. Subaru. Now, Subaru, high failure rates on ignition, but Greg, why don't you get on with your story? All right, I have a, a 2002 Subaru Forester, 2.5 liter, and this car, the customer says, you know, she loses all her power all of a sudden. Doesn't stall, but she steps down, car doesn't do anything, is the complaint. So I tell her, okay, let me look at codes, I smell the transmission fluid, look at transmission fluid, nothing looks bad. 
They did a tune-up at 90,000 miles. Um, there's something obviously bad with the coil. You can even remove the coil, look underneath. There's just nothing obviously wrong with this car. Because those go good. How about back pressure? Exhaust back pressure we did not check. <laughs> so I... Uh. <laughs> Especially, you know, when, when you say uh, high failure rates, and you guys have worked on Subarus, I think you would all agree with me. I mean, ignition-wise, they're not the greatest, right? But back pressure can really cause this problem, especially but, when it's getting hot. But intermittent problem? That's what I was going to say. But well, this was, this was only when it was wet, too, right? And yes. So oh, this, this one, this was yes, wet. And, and, by, okay. and by the way, there wasn't a calculated efficiency issue, which would which would reflect the mechanical issue of the engine, which back pressure would be. So I have no reason to go in that direction. That being said, um, so I drive this car, I give her my car, she drove 500 miles on it, and I drive her car for a week, and it only did it for me twice. Once, it was sort of moist morning, and it sort of shuddered a bit, 40 miles per hour, and it felt like it wasn't shifting. Then again... Was it in lockup? What? Was it in lockup? Was it automatic? Automatic transmission. Was it in lockup? 40 miles per hour going Could be. straight. Yes, so then it did it one other time in the middle of torrential downpour on Sunday. And it was at idle, it was misfiring, very obviously misfiring, but it really did not feel like a misfire 40 something miles per hour when we got to do it. Again, thing in common, wet. I got a call from the after, I wanted to fix the misfire first, being that a misfire could feel like a transmission. No doubt. So new coil plugs, wires, uh, valve cover gaskets, all done. And they get a call from the customer this morning. The car is still doing it. And we just had rain this morning. So I am very confused. Um, I know, Eric, you're giving some good advice. I'm just saying look at the O2 values and bolt on that. The upstream O2 sensor. Did you see it when you are skipping? You, you see an ashy O2 sensor. Did you drive it with the scan tool on it? Yes. And then get anything? Well, yeah, this it's not getting any codes. Um, we were looking at oxygen sensor really to see if it was running rich or lean, anything sudden. You know, uh, you know trend. what I would do if you suspect a tranny problem, and it, it always happens at 40 something, 40 ish? That's that, the two times it happened. Okay. I would put it, uh, look at the transmission and look at the PID for TC lockup and and see if that's when it's being commanded. That's when it pays to have be connected to the right scan tool that time. Yeah, uh, that's I true. I won't name the company. And, and the other problem, of course, is if you're alone driving it and you're looking at the scan tool a lot, you might eliminate the problem by crashing the car. <laughs> and they collect the money. <laughs> so you got to be careful. Yeah, you put it in record mode. Yeah. Now, so yes. So, so someone asked, the Subaru use air fuel sensors? The answer is yes. This, yeah. This particular car had a front air fuel a few months ago replaced, um, and I believe the spec on that, if I remember right, something like 2.47 volts, you know, or one one lambda zero amps, you know, that's what you'd be looking at. But you know, to be honest, they have that Geico insurance, so I think they should just pay the 250 and get the tranny. I, I mean. I'm game for that. Did you check? What if you find out it's a driver and a computer after you've just changed the tranny? I'm sorry? If it's a what if it's and a driver computer? and a computer for torque converter lockup and you just replace the tranny? What you do is you pocket money for transmission, then you fix Stop. whatever. <laughs> 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 Frank, this is going on. Frank, this is on my side. Frank is only, only joking. No, no, in all seriousness, that's, that's the thing. I would probably drive with a different scan tool or look to see, like what Eric said about the oxygen, well, Air fuel sensor. Let's yeah. get modern yeah. to, see, to see if it's it's still a misfire. Being that it's that's the thing that it's moist. The, I mean, a transmission doesn't care if it can it's be wet. A connector. It, the, it, if be it, a, it does care if it's an electrical connector, and that's the other thing I wanted to suggest. Take the connector off the transmission and see if you've got any oil migrating up or any signs of corrosion from water right. getting in. And I don't just use water. I use ammonia water. Yeah. Ammonia yeah. water. Okay. The reason for that is it will. It's a great conductor. Yes. Are you getting a sharp or a or hesitation? He, he makes it. Or ammonia or he uses ammonia. ammonia and water as a solution to find a short. The, the thing is, you got to watch what it attacks. Yeah. And plus, you can use the toilet afterwards. You can use the baking soda. Yeah, you got to you got to neutralize it. Mm -hmm. Clean it. Short. So you were saying something, Ed? Is it a, a sharp misfire or is it a hesitation? No, it's almost like you step down on the pedal. Well, first the misfire. It was like it was like this. At idle, at idle, the misfire is obvious. And you fixed that. And I fixed that. 
Right. But the the mis mystery misfire slash mystery transmission of that just feels like you step down, nothing's happening. Nothing's and happening. No nothing, power. No power. It's just low power, and when you're you losing that, that TPS, like it has you, better, you better look at that TPS. That TPS yeah, been, give you a, but TPS been replaced, but not because I wanted to. The I, customer I demanded about, it. I don't care about replacing a TPS. Look at the signal at the computer. Right. Why is, is it getting it? Does this thing have a mass he airflow? It reads too many things online. Does it have a mass airflow? No. This is speed density system. And what's that? What's that map sensor reading? At idle, and that could be screwed. I, I'd be looking at pits. I'd be looking at those pits carefully. I'd graph that pit. Yeah. Yours too. Yeah. Sure, sure. Have you looked at fuel trims? Fuel trims? Great. Fuel trims are normal. Yeah, but when the problem is occurring. I'm sorry? I mean, zero? When the problem is occurring, it was normal. You know, like 2% plus or minus. That's why the Bernie tool is uh, okay. good on fuel trims. Yeah, you should yeah. have the Bernie tool. Can you put a fuel pressure gauge on Um. No, no fuel pressure gauge. Do it. But again, okay. fuel. But fuel trims are normal. I'm going to go through all that effort. It's not compensating for a fuel issue. Because you have volume issue. But fuel trim is still fuel trim is still trim. It's actually occurring when you step on a fuel on an accelerator. Were you looking at fuel trims then? Yeah, you that's said it's intermittent. Yeah, you should look right then. What's happening? Yeah, I believe graph fuel trim, graph TPS, TPS. graph map. Yeah, make sure your and intake map. ducts are not leaking too. Makes you good. But, right. But exactly. you know, intake ducts wouldn't that, leak that water. Would, that would account for the air or for the water. Oh. If your ducts are leaking. Yeah. I had one. And it, yeah. same, same scenario. Yeah. I pulled, I was working the vehicle, I pulled it up just a little bit. There's a little breather tube that goes on underneath the, underneath the boot, the big boot. Do a good visual and on it, it. And it came off in this car, we're not going anywhere. But was that on a speed density system yeah. or mass air? No speed. But you probably, but you would and have had trims weren't out of whack. But it was doing it all the time. Speed density, you're gonna, you're gonna yeah, see it it's gonna run whack. rich. It's gonna run rich in the back of the lake. But oh, yeah, anything is possible, you know. Uh, the uh, vehicles that are out there are so complex, and you get something that's just not right. And unfortunately, consumers don't bring their car to one person. They bring it to multiple people, or like this customer. You know, telling Craig demanded that he changes the because he because he surfed the web and he found out that somebody else Google changed. Yeah, yeah, Google, right? Yeah, Google Tech and uh, exactly. Google and sometimes tech, that runs right. into a problem. In reality, are you, are you do, is this an idle and they're most having a problem? I'm sorry. At idle, you're having this problem most. No, of it's the real, 40 the real miles thing. An hour. The real thing that scares them is what's happening at 40. Would well, you ever load it and put it on just ignition and lines would see a It's not going to do it in the in the bed. Hey, look. This guy had one there knock sensor. That's a good. That's a good possibility. You know he's That's another thing. Yeah, look at knock. Oh, that's an idea. Hey, Mike, I'm going to look into that. And Subaru could be retarding the crap out of the timing. In fact, in my Logsco book, I have a picture of a great Subaru. I just did knock sensor today. Hey, Mike, Mike, what year was that Subaru? Even though the 2.5s are all the same for like 15 years, I just want to make sure it's. What year is yours? Oh, two. Mine was an O2. We put a knock sensor in today. Had a code for that. You, you yeah. put your knock sensor in today. <laughs> Look at that. No, I'm telling you, any other always comes with a knock sensor code. Then, oh, knock. I get it. Knock, knock. Knock, knock. <laughs> well, Mr. Hicks, yes, sir. Our, our time is coming to an end. Well, and, it was a lot uh, of fun. I had a great time. <laughs> we want to thank you for um, being our guest speaker. Hopefully, Everyone out there, we want to remind you that you can go to the uh, Wells Tech, was that? On, t on well, a. Yeah, our website is uh, uh, Wells VE, as Vehicle Electronics.com. Okay. And on YouTube? Wells. And on YouTube, it's Wells Tech. So you should go out there, check that out, everyone. Uh, We've got some great stuff on our website, pin out charts. Uh, specs for coils, uh, all different kinds of stuff. You Amper specs. Great Amper specs. Amper specs. Amper specs for Amper. like uh, solenoids, that kind of thing. Yeah. Relays, yeah. Okay. So he yeah, has that. Some good stuff. Now we'd again uh, like to thank you and want to remind everyone out there. Next Thursday night we have a uh, on vehicle. 
uh, using the snap-on modus, but that works with any of your snap-on tools. We'll be hooking it up to a couple of different vehicles, looking at PIDs, looking at graphing, troubleshooting, and a bunch more. So if you uh, tune in, you can ask us questions and we'll get to some of your answers. We also want to remind you about our California big event in Ontario, California, September 29th, 9th, uh, 2012. We'll be out there and uh, our sponsors, OTC, SPX, Power Probe, ATS, that's Automotive Test Solutions, Smoke Wizard, Launch, and Bosch. And our buddies from Welds will donate something or I'll uh, come out there and get you. <laughs> I'm only kidding. Uh, well, give me a call tomorrow. We need to talk about that. Yeah. <laughs> well, Welds has been a big sponsor. I'm only kidding. Um, but Welds no, has... No, honestly, give me a call. Okay. We, I'll do that. And uh, if you're in the California area, also you can see us a full-page ad, two-page ad in uh, Motor Age out in the California area. So if you need to get in touch with us, it's tstseminars.org. We're a non-for-profit 501c3, and we're about helping technicians. So if uh, you're in that area, come out. We start up here in September in, uh, on the East Coast, Massachusetts, Connecticut, uh, New Jersey, and here in New York, and we always do a live webcast. It'll be a three-and-a-half-hour seminar, and we will have someone from Wells coming back out this year. We had Jim Gill, who did a great job last year for us, was Mark as a chicken to fly. <laughs> See, I'm always getting you, buddy. But uh, we, we even welcome you out here, believe it or not. But we welcome all of you, and uh, once again, thank you for your time. For TST headquarters in New York, I'm G. Trulia. Have a good night.